The year was 1873. And the king of the crew tribe in West Africa just received word that his wife had given birth to a son. He now had the promised prince, the heir he needed to extend his family's reign of this small tribe in West Africa. He gave birth to a boy named Kabu. Kabu was the famous name of warriors in their tribe. But at the age of 14, when Kabu had grown up, they reached a place of poverty and famine inside of their community. So all the surrounding tribes of the villages were undergoing this famine, undergoing this drought. And when Kabu was working in the field, he was ambushed by a rival tribe and held hostage. They then tied him up in the middle of their village, tied him to a stake, and they demanded all the reserves and resources of food and water from the crew tribe. As they did so, they would beat him every day, demanding the rations of food that the crew had saved. Now, they were permitted to send over one messenger to give Kabu food and water. Upon doing so, this messenger from the village would come over. They would have to watch him be beaten in the middle of the desert heat, and then they could give him food and water. This poor young boy was undergoing tremendous agony. This father, not knowing what to do, exhausted all the resources of the village. Everything they had, he gave to this rival tribe, even to the fact where he was willing to offer his daughter. But after all the resources were exhausted, they determined that Kabu was worthless to them and he was going to be executed. As they took him off the stake, they bound him with ropes. They began to dig a hole. And what they would do when they would execute someone in this village is they would bury them up to their neck and let the elements kill them or the animals that surrounded them. So as they're building this hole, digging this hole, here is Kabu, and he cries out to the God they worshipped in this tribe. They referred to him as the Great Father. What made this unique compared to other African tribes is they believed in one supreme God. We think about this. Romans talks about this God of creation that will reveal himself to those that are far out, right? He calls out to the one great father, the eldest father they had. As he cries out, this burst of light comes from the clouds. A voice comes, his ropes loosen, and says, Kabu, run. You hear a voice like that, you're going to run. So he runs into the village. He runs into the jungle. As he's running, he's now being chased by them with spears. And the voice says, hide in this tree. He hides in the trunk of a tree. It cloaks him with this light. They can't see him. They move on. And now he's left in the jungles of Africa. No food, no water, naked, nowhere to go. This light then directs him to an outlying village in Monrovia. I don't know exactly how far that was, but it was a pretty significant hike he had to take. As he enters there, he finds this building. It turns out these Monrovian missionaries came and built a church. He enters this place naked. They can't really communicate with him because he has a specific dialect. Turns out one of the missionaries speaks his dialect. It, he finds out that he's been running from people that had captured him. They clothe him and invite him to the church service that night. As he's at the church service, they begin to speak on the Apostle Paul's calling in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus. And they said, this light shone from the sky and called his name. He stands up and begins to yell. The interpreter interprets his story. He says, that same light called my name. Who is this God that I must give my life to? To, gives his life to Jesus, is baptized that night, right? At 14, he then, he says, I want to learn, I want to learn. Well, the only way they can teach him the Bible is if they teach him English. That's all they had. So every day he's working with the teacher of the village, learning English through the Bible. Every night he would commit time, he said, to talk to my father. Four years, he learns how to paint and studies the word, memorizes the Bible. As he's doing this, he says, I must learn more. The teacher says, I have nothing more to teach you. And she says in jest, the only way I could teach you more is if you met my teacher, Stephen Merritt. And he says, take me to Stephen Merritt. He says, you can't go to Stephen Merritt. He's in New York. He says, take me to New York. She's like, I can't take you to New York. He says, let me talk to my father about this. Goes home that night. Wakes up the next morning with a packed bag and says, goodbye, I'm off to New York. She says, what do you mean? She said, my father said to go to the port and he'll take me on a boat there. She doesn't know what to do, gives him only, the only money she has. He arrives there. As he arrives, a boat comes and sets dock that's going to New York the next day. 
He says, my father told me to go on your boat because I'm going to go see a man named Stephen Merritt. He says, I don't care who your father is or who Stephen Merritt is. You're not on this boat. Well, the captain's really a gruff character, right? He says, you're not permitted to go on the boat. The men go into the city. Two men get sick and are now unable to travel and be deckhands. They hire this boy, Kabu, to be the deckhand. Well, when he left with the missionary and go back, they renamed him Samuel, just as Samuel was called by God. So he went by Samuel Kabu Morris after another missionary. So he's now on this boat. No one likes him. He's known for talking to himself at night, again, praying to his father. Well, one day, there's a fight that breaks out on the ship. There was a bandit that was one of the crewmen. He takes a knife, goes to murder another man. Kabu steps in the middle, and as the knife is coming down, a hand from heaven holds the knife from striking Kabu. Preach is the gospel, half of the crew gets saved, including the, cap the captain. They then arrive to New York. He gets off this boat. As he's there, he calls everyone's attention that he's looking for Stephen Merritt, who his father told him he had to meet. He preaches the gospel, leads more people to Jesus on the dock. As they are under weeping, a woman says, I know Stephen Merritt. Let me take you to him. He gets on this carriage, goes to Stephen's house, and she says, this is the man you're looking for. He says, I've never met this boy in my life. He's now 18 years old. Stephen doesn't know what to do. He says, well, I guess I'll take you to church. So they had a Sunday school and a night service. That Sunday morning, dresses him up in the suit, like we see here. As he goes there, Stephen was an elder, and so he goes to an elders meeting as they have the Sunday school. Now, Sunday school then was for all ages. As he's there with broken English, he stands up and says, I have a story to share. As he shares his story, the entire place bursts in weeping. Revival breaks out in this schoolhouse. In doing so, Stephen comes in and they all say, we have now started the Samuel Kabu Morris Missionary Fund. We want more missionaries like him. As he's there for just a month, they say, you need more education. There's the one broken part of this story. You need more education. You need to go to university. They all raise money to send him to Taylor University at 18. He goes out to Taylor University, preaches throughout all the city of Taylor, leads most of the city to the Lord. At 20 years old, he contracts pneumonia, passes away suddenly. The entire city joins for his memorial. Start a fund that still exists today to send missionaries to Africa. In six years, a young boy with a small call in a captured village changed an entire city. That's the same Holy Spirit that was raising Jesus from the dead that rested on that man that now lives inside of you. This is a calling we're all called to carry. Here's where we are at in culture. We are at a crisis of culture. Right now, many don't know what to do. Unemployment's the highest in our lifetime. We then have many that are losing their jobs just trying to preserve their personal freedoms and religious rights. And now they're being forced into firings, not knowing what to do. And it's had many questioning their calling. God, what are you asking me to do in this season? What are you asking me to do? What's my calling in life? But unlike many in the West where our calling is often associated or tied to our career, as Christians, our calling is never in question. They can't fire you from your calling in Christ. You don't need a religious exemption to keep your calling in Jesus. And so when you stand in this place, we have to recognize we are called for a specific purpose that Jesus has formed for you when you were in your mother's womb. Now this word calling is the Greek word kaleo, which means to summon by name. I think of that young boy as he was there with those ropes tying him where God called him. You say, well, if I had a call like Kabu, then maybe I'd follow Jesus. Listen, he was in slavery for three months. I choose this path. Let me just be honest with you. It means to summon or call by name. It means that you're the recipient of a gift. Now, for many of us, we wonder, God, what, what's my calling? What am I called to? How do I do this? And this is where we have to understand. We're starting from the wrong premise. And we're waiting for this calling to magically arrive. But what if we're asking for an answer to a question the Bible already answers? What if we're asking a question 
looking for an answer, the Bible already answers. See, this calling is given to us the moment you enter into covenant with Jesus. Romans chapter 1, verse 6. You who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. The problem with our language is we just kind of run over these verses as generic, especially when you've been conditioned in church. This phrase right here that Paul is writing is a covenantal sentence. It's marital language. He says, I've called you to belong. You've call, been called to belong to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom he called you into fellowship with his son. This is the word koinonia. He's called you into the household of God. Now here's what's unique about the Eastern culture. When you were welcomed into someone's house, they were responsible for your safety and provision. You've been called into fellowship with Jesus. You've been called into koinonia with Jesus. And if that's not enough, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. You not only are called into marital belonging relationship, you're not only called into protection and provision covenant, you are called his children. And you're not just a kid of a poor dad. You're the child of a king. That's a big, significant detail there, church. And when you're called as a child of the king, it means you have rights to his inheritance. And Ephesians 1 says you've been given this inheritance in the Holy Spirit. You have access at your disposal, all the gifts, the same spirit that Jesus walked in, the same spirit that young boy Kabu walked in. You have access to these things. And the question is not what is my calling. I think it's better portrayed as this. It's what is my assignment? See, we get these things convoluted. Our, our language is limited. But we have to understand the biblical paradigm is this. You are called when you say yes to covenant with Jesus. The next question is, what are you assigning me to? Your calling is fixed. Your assignment is fluid. Your calling is set in stone. You've been called into covenantal relationship. You've been called into his household. You've been called as his child. And from that position, you're constantly asking, what is my next assignment? Because what we have this illusion in the Western world is that our calling is always in jeopardy. Your calling is always at risk. It's never at risk in Jesus. It's fixed. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Only let each person live the life unto the Lord that he has assigned them and to which he has called you to. The question in this season is, God, what is my assignment? Some assignments are longer. Some assignments are shorter. And what I've noticed is the moment that recall didn't go the way for many people, it felt like their assignment and their calling was in jeopardy. And I saw many people sell their homes, leverage all their debt to get out of a state, trying to escape a government that is over all the land. It's an illusion if you think the Antichrist spirit is just confined to California and New York. We are called citizens of a kingdom that is greater than America. We are called citizens of a kingdom that is in heaven. And we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Maybe it's time for you to stop judging Newsom and pray for Newsom and his wife. That he's haunted in the dreams by Jesus. That he hears the fear of the Lord. That's our calling as a church. You think Paul was nervous because of Nero? Come on. We have to recognize that when Jesus was around, there was crucifixes lining the aisleways. They didn't invent it for Jesus. They invented it for insurrectionists. But we serve one who conquered the grave and gave confidence. What is your assignment? Not what's your zip code supposed to be. It's the wrong premise, church. Where is he calling you to? He can do this. And what we're going to notice is in 1 Samuel 16, this is one of the most pivotal passages in all of the Old Testament. It hinges on this moment. This is a hinge of history. And there's one element we focus on and we miss the other components. 
the anointing of David would never take place if Samuel didn't say yes. In 1 Samuel 16, Yahweh gives an exhortation that seems insensitive. And here's what I want to warn you with. Grief is not to be understated. Grief is a real emotion. It's, it's, it's something we have to go through. We deal in the premise of the fall. There's sin, sadness, and death. We get those things. But when you're undergoing grief, God comes in for, you know, 2 Corinthians 1 as a comforter. This is, this is key. And what we've noticed as we study, I'll probably be about 10 more minutes, buddy. You don't have to worry. Okay. <laughs> he, he's following the rules. He, he knows the rules. Jesus comes in as our comforter in the midst of grief. Now, what we've noticed, psychologists have said, is that America is now in a complicated grief state as a nation. Before the pandemic took place, whatever you want to call that, approximately 65 million people suffered from what they call complicated grief. They now believe it could be nearly 50% of our population is living in complicated grief. Here's what's hard about complicated grief. You cannot pinpoint exactly what you're grieving. When you're in complicated grief, there's so many tragedies taking place, you can't pinpoint or execute what that thing is you're supposed to be grieving. That's what many are wrestling in this season. But here's what the enemy wants. He wants you to live in a state of suspended grief. He wants your grief state to be eternal, not temporal. That's not how God designed it. And outside of the covenant with Jesus, I can understand how that would feel hopeless. You have access to the comforter that is with you. It's not to stuff or ignore our grief, as my friend Mike Everson would say, but to offer our grief unto Jesus to bring healing. In 1 Samuel 15, we notice this. Saul has rejected God's covenant. He's broken the rules big time. And as a result, the kingdom's been torn from him. And Samuel doesn't know what to do. He's stuck. He's confused. He's unclear. As he goes to Yahweh in prayer, the voice comes to him that he does not want to hear. When you're discouraged and you go to your secret place prayer time, right, and you're there, you want to hear how much Jesus loves you. How I'm so proud of you. You know the self-talk we give ourselves, right? But what I love about our God is he tells us not what we want to hear, but need to hear. And this is what he tells Samuel. How long will you grieve over Saul? Fill your horn with oil and anoint the king I've called. It's that shock state that, he's en that he enters into and starts to recognize, oh my goodness, I have an assignment that I need to fulfill. How long will you grieve over 2020? How long will you grieve over unemployment? How long will you grieve over vaccine mandates? What's the assignment Jesus is giving you? What's the witness he has for you right now? That's a question I can't answer, but God knows you need to ask. What's the assignment? Where has he called you to be? Where are you supposed to be next? Where are you supposed to work? Because guess what? He always provides a way. He makes it clear. He makes a way when there is no way. Samuel appropriately announces, I can't do that. If I do so, Saul will hear my life's in jeopardy. Guess what? You anoint a new king while another king's in office? That's treason. You're dead. God then says, I'm going to give you a heifer. Go to Jesse the Bethlehemite. You're going to anoint one of his sons as king. And then you go there for sacrifice. The perfect cover, right? He goes to the town center. As he enters there, they say, do you come peaceably? Most likely, Jesse is one of these men, one of the elders at the gate. Now, if a prophet came to your town unannounced, that's not a party. You don't want prophets coming to your town unannounced, especially when it's not a sacrificial day or a ceremonial day. Do you come peacefully? Do you come with shalom? He says, I come with shalom, right? I come with peace. Jesse, consecrate your household. Bring your sons to the meal. As he goes there, he knows that he's looking for the next king. Jesse has no clue what's taking place. He brings his seven sons. He looks at the first one. He's like, 
Bingo. That's it. Handsome kid, tall. See, our eyes are deceptive. He sees this tall, handsome type that is the perfect to be a leader. And this is what Yahweh says, I've rejected him. Oh, that's hard. But here's what he says. I look not at the outward appearance. Literally, the, cr the crude Hebrew word is the face. I look not at the face. I look at the heart. Now, the heart here is not the physical organ. To the Hebrew, it meant the seat and center of one's life. He's looking at the throne of your heart and saying, who's at the occupancy? Now, here's what we have to understand. When he rejects Eliab, he's not rejecting him for all eternity. He still has a calling. This just isn't his assignment. It's not the rejection of Eliab, the person. He made him in his image and likeness. We have really big theological problems if that's the case right now. This is not his assignment. He goes to the next one, not his assignment. The next one, not his assignment. Then finally, Yahweh says, I have chosen none of these. This concept of choosing is really convoluted in the New Testament. There's some really broken theology, is theology around election. And here's what we have to understand. One of the contexts is off, or verses taken out of context is Matthew 22, 14. Many are called, few are chosen. And the way that's been taught and preached throughout the last several decades is you don't know if you're chosen till the day of judgment. Your salvation's in jeopardy. How do you know if you're the elect of God? And that word chosen is electos. That's where we get the word election. Here's what we don't understand. We've made the gospel an Eastern religion, right? In many ways, from a Jewish background, very Western. And we use legal language that was developed in the 1500s by lawyers. Guess what? That's not how this was written. So when Calvin and all of them wrote this, they were lawyers. This is not a legal document in that manner. They left all the Jewishness of Jesus on the table. They disregarded it. Here's what we have to understand. Every time you see a word that causes curiosity and questioning, you have to ask, what's the context in the Old Testament? And every time we see choosing mentioned in the Old Testament, in this context, it has to do with covenant. So what does he do? He chooses Abraham as his heir. He then chooses Abraham's offspring. He chooses Jacob. All this has to do with those he's chosen for covenant. And what's the context of Matthew 22? A wedding ceremony. What's the main context of a wedding ceremony? Covenant. He's calling many to the covenantal marriage ceremony. They reject him. He then invites those that don't want to be there into the covenantal marriage ceremony and says, many are called, few are chosen. The chosen are those that respond to the call. That's the whole context. So when you say yes to Jesus, guess what? You were picked. You may be left out all your life. You have a call when you said yes to Jesus. He says, none of these are chosen. Then Samuel says, are these all your sons? And he says, no, there remains yet one in the field. Here's what we have to ask. And I'm going to say something highly controversial here. Why is David not at the feast? Everybody says, well, he was the youngest. Who would look after the sheep? Not true. For Samuel 17, there is a keeper of the sheep when he goes and visits the army. Okay, well, that's, that's there. Well, he was the youngest. He would have chosen his seven other sons. He doesn't know the purpose of the ceremony. You have Samuel, the most important person in the kingdom next to Saul, which is technically more important than Saul because he's the one that anointed Saul. And in that culture, you don't bring all of your sons. Secondly, David's a male, not a female. If he was a female, it would be understood. But he's a male. You invite all of your sons. He's listed as, there's eight, eight sons here. He only acknowledges seven. Here's why I believe David was not invited to the ceremony. David was an illegitimate son. David was an illegitimate son. What's your proof? A lot of rabbis. Most Jewish culture believe Jesus, that David pardon the term, was a bastard. That's the context. Why do we know this? Out of all the kings, he's the only one without his mother mentioned. 
He wasn't invited to a feast with the big dog of the nation. And then the writer of Samuel changes seven sons to eight sons by the next chapter. When Yahweh tells him, I want you to anoint one of Jesse's sons in 1 Samuel 16, 1 and 2, he saw him as a son, even though he wasn't legitimately so or recognized as one. See, because he was a son of God in that context. See, Jesus sees you not as the world sees you or those as they would label you. Some of you are a little nervous still. You're like, I don't know if this is super scriptural. <laughs> Here's the clincher. Psalm 51.5. This will change a lot of your theology. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Change that verse for you a little bit. This is taught in Western theology as the ongoing sin of Adam, which we can translate as that. That's not very Jewish, though. That's not how they thought in that time. David would reference himself as a holy one through most of the Psalms. And yet his tone changes here. What we learn in Psalm 51 is he's carrying on the generational sin of his father by having adultery with Bathsheba like his own dad did with him. But Yahweh sees a different son. He sees David as he's called to be, not how he is. And David had an assignment in the field that prepared him for the assignment to face a giant and soon become a king. And when Samuel sees David, he pours oil upon him. And it says the Holy Spirit rushed upon David and remained with him that day forward. If you've been questioning, if you're anointed by God, if you've been questioning all these things, let's talk about choosing. We talked about choosing with covenant. Guess what Galatians says? You are the seed of Abraham, the promised ones of God. You have heirs to the promise. Secondly, 1 John chapter 2, you have been anointed by the Holy One. The same anointing that rested on David, the same spirit that operated through Jesus, the same spirit that worked through that boy Kabu now lives in you. And the Spirit of God has given you all you need for the assignment that you have in front of you. That's the question today. You are called, but what is your assignment? What's your next? God's been speaking to you about it. It just may not seem practical. It may not seem like the right way or the right decision. He'll make it clear. But God, I would lose my job. I would lose my life. He'll provide a way if you ask him. My friend Kerry had a dream last week that I thought was so significant as he had no idea what we were talking about these last two weeks. And as he comes forward, just real quick, honor Kerry real quick, and he's going to share a quick dream. Let's stand together as we're going to close here in a minute. <clears throat> What's up, Rock fam? All right, so a couple weeks ago, I had this dream where on this stage here, there was a bunch of leaders and Pastor Brandon leading it. They were forging weapons on this stage here. And as I panned back out in this dream, it was a low light setting. Everybody was working from their heart on these weapons on this stage here. There was an anvil. I think that's what you say, what they forge weapons on and make the, it, it was sitting on the stage here and on the side of it, was Isaiah 54, 17. It says, no weapon forged against you will prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord's, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. So as I thought about this dream, I started praying into it more like, God, why did you make this so clear to me? Like, what's the relevance of this? Relevance of this? And he started telling me that there's a war, not only in our church, but in our city, in our nations, and we're called to pray. So he said, first in that dream, he says, pray for your pastors. So I was like, easy, do that all the time. So about a week later, he gives me another dream, and the weapons are complete. 
the building's lit, so bright and so beautiful in here. And the leaders are on this stage and the congregation is lined up. And Pastor Brandon is handing weapons to each person that walks up and they're coming down. And as I'm watching this happen, it's just such a beautiful sight. I look over and Jesus is sitting on the steps right over here. And he's got such joy on his face and his hand is up and he's praying in tongues over everybody that's receiving these weapons. So as I thought, like, God, are we going to war like physically? <laughs> I was like, I don't know if that's the right thing to do here. <laughs> and so he says, no, my son. He said, these swords are not physical swords. These swords are the gifts that I've given everybody to use in your city, in your nation, to pray. So what God is asking is for each of us to find in our hearts, what is that gift that I have given you and how are you gonna use it in these times right now? That's a dream. Put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you right now. The Holy Spirit's gonna release things in this house. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you've equipped us for the task at hand. We thank you that you've called us for such a time as this. Just as you did Esther, you called her out, prepared her to be a voice to her nation. God, I thank you that you've prepared many in this house to speak truth in love. And sometimes it may sound like it's not love, but it's love. And so, Father, we declare, give us the weapons that are needed. Holy Spirit, rush upon us. Equip us for this moment right now. Uh, my brother, Ken Burks. Ken Burks, real quick. Ken. Come up here real quick. I want you just to pray and release. I feel like you got something you're going to release on this house. Just again, keep your hands on the person next to you. My friend Ken is an elder in this house for many years. Just release a Father's blessing over us. Amen. Lord God, we just come before you tonight, this afternoon, and we just pray, Lord, for each and every person here. God, that the, the gift that you have bestowed on them, Lord, would just rise up within each and every person, Lord. God, that we would all know that assignment that you have given to us, and we would not only know it, but we would put it to use, and we would walk in it, and we would be faithful with it, Lord God. And so we just release your blessing over this house today, God, knowing that you are able to do whatever you have given us to do. You can do it in our lives because we rely upon on your precious Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.